Welcome to the John Aran House. The house was built between 1875 to 1878. Um, took three years to build. All the uh, materials were acquired on site locally, and the contractor was a Mr. Falls. John Aran and his wife Elizabeth, Elizabeth inherited the property uh, back in 1874, and a year later they started construction on the house. They had three children, two daughters, a Laura and Florence, and a son, Jay. John and Jay Rand bought the Friendship Flower Mill in 1896. Now, John sold this property in 1883, so they must have moved back at a later date. Uh, as, as I recall, in the late 1800s, one of the relatives repurchased the property, and uh, sold it again in, in, in the early 1900s. After that, it uh, changed hands several times. When John and his family lived here, they raised cows, chickens, turkeys, and he had race horses. Uh, one of the, he had a racetrack over in the primitive area where he raced the horses. Behind you, you'll see a uh, stairway that goes up to the second floor. That's where the hired hands would go up to their bedroom. Where we're standing right now is the front foyer. This would have been where the employees would have hung out. This is where they would have ate their meals. The hired hands that worked in the field would have gone upstairs to their bedroom. And uh, the maids and so forth would have been in the kitchen and so forth. Over here above the piano is, uh, is Walter Klein. He was from Tennessee, and he was a second president of the MMLRA, and he was uh, president from 1934 to 1939. In 1966, the MMLRA purchased this property, 204 acres, with a barn, a house, two ponds, and several outbuildings, and uh, they paid a little under $43,000. Uh, at that time, the Offices for uh, NMRA were in Shelbyville, and they shortly thereafter moved here. Upstairs, in 1966, they changed the upstairs into a, an apartment, and uh, for Maxine Moss and her husband, uh, Ron, who was a caretaker, and also later on, Bill Kissel. Uh, who also stayed here and was a caretaker. And then in 1989, the building was more or less closed down. And when the offices moved to the metal building was in 1976, uh, but then in 1989, the muzzle blast part moved back over to the, the lower half of the building. So in 1966, when they, when the other owner had bought the pr property, the stairway that goes up to the second floor was used as a pipe chase because that was an easy way to get from the basement to the second floor. So that stairway was closed off. It's very steep and very narrow. In fact, well, like me, probably I can't get in there. Um, the mantle over here was missing at the time, and Denise Goodpasture and Sharon Cunningham were at a National, uh, National Rifle Association conference in St. Louis and they found that mantle, purchased it because it would fit, worked fine, and then the president at the time, Owen Collins, brought it back to Friendship for a spring shoot, which at that time they installed it. This would have been the kitchen. This would have been where the female employees would have cooked the meals for the family. This is where they would have done all their the regular cooking on a daily basis. There was a pantry, a cook stove, and one of the nice things about this is that it has five openings in a, in a room this size. Back here is what I call the tool room. Back in the day, this would have been the summer kitchen. This would have been where the uh, 
employees and the rands would have did all their heavy cooking. What I understand this is where they churned the milk and the butter and uh, moved it to and sent it to Cincinnati in, in 50 pound containers. So there was a lot of heavy work out back here. Uh, a big fireplace to, to maybe render their meats or whatever. Um, over here we have a great wheel lathe. And an apprentice would turn the lathe while the car while the craftsman would, would do the, the spinning of the of this spindle or whatever it was he was making. And over here we have a rifling machine and several tools. One of the ones I haven't figured out what to do with is this one because I have no idea what that is. We also have four ink drawings that were made back in 1976 by an artist by the name of Vensky. It shows our four principles here, pistol, rifle, primitive, and shotgun. And then we have several blacksmithing, well, lots of blacksmithing equipment here. And we even have a pretend type forge. A lot of people ask about the gates on the windows and the doors. Uh, they weren't for prisoners, they weren't for, for bad people or anything like that. In 1979, when they turned this into a museum, uh, they put the bars on the windows and the doors because at night they would keep the exhibits in here and they wanted them to be secure. So hence, hence the doors. Over here we have a hand-powered drill press. I call it self-propel because you propel it yourself. This would have been a formal dining room. This is where the, the rams would have been served their meals um, and their guests whenever, whenever they would have guests. Uh, this is where they would, would eat. Uh, over here we have a picture of Red Ferris. Red Ferris was one of the founding members of the association. Uh, he did all the correspondence. He did everything for the association except being present. He was never president of the association, but he was the lifeblood of the association in the early years. How we got to Friendship Indiana was there was two two major forces. One was well. Red Ferris was in Portsmouth, but uh, Pal Crosley and Boss Johnson were in Cincinnati. Pal Crosley, who, who made the, our, the Crosley radios, Crosley cars, and so forth, and Boss Johnson, who was a WLW radio announcer, who did a farm report, and he would always talk about uh, national muzzle letters and so forth. Now, he lived in Aurora, so it was a, would be a lot easier for him to come here than it would be to go to Portsmouth, Ohio. So uh, originally they, they shot up in Dillsboro and they shot behind the school in Friendship. And eventually, right before World War II, they purchased the 57 acres across the road. And that is, that is when uh, they started the Friendship, the friendship uh, Association. Over here we have a signal cannon. This past winter we found the accessory kit that went with it. It's a number 1848. Now I don't know if that's the number or if that's the year, but that's uh, that's the only information that I can find on it. This was the formal. This was a 
formal parlor, this would have been where uh, the Rams would have done all their entertaining. I'm told that the family was not allowed in this room except when they had guests, nor were employees. So this was this was the 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 nice place that they would entertain in. Over on that wall, we have personal houses ink drawings that he did for the 50th anniversary of the association. Below that we have some trophies from the, from the Can-Am, which was uh, muzzleloading shoots between Canada and, and the United States. Uh, they would shoot back and forth between individual uh, ranges each year. Over here we have a display of Norm Brockway's equipment. Uh, he was a uh, rifle smith. This is one of his his rifle machines, and I understand that in the early 2000s they used to take this on the porch and uh, do a rifle during the shoots. Some of his targets are over on the board there, and they were shot at 220 yards with some of his guns, and those are pictures of him on the wall there. We have some, some pictures on the wall of uh, Ellen and Walt Grody's uh, ribbons that they won over the years, which they donated to the association. And down here is Norm Brockway's shooting box. He, I, I, I'm not into the long range shooting, but from what I, I see, he used pa paper patch bullets. Whereas I'm, I'm familiar with with the uh, cloth patch, but he used paper patch bullets with elongated uh, bullets. Back here is the guest bedroom. This is where, if they, if the Rams would have had guests, they would have. Stayed back here. Uh, we left some of the wallpaper on the walls to kind of show what it used to look like. Uh, we got about halfway through scraping, it got tired, said, hey, now we gotta leave this on here to show uh, what it used to look like. The ceiling was in bad shape, so we had to take the, the wallpaper down off a bit. But from what I understand, the, uh, the reason the wallpaper was metallic was so that the candles and so forth will reflect the light when they walk into the room, so it will make the room brighter. Now we use it as a storeroom for some of our archives. This is, this is a lot of stuff that was donated from several of the vendors over here. And we also have a, the Last Chance Hotel. It was run by Bull Ramsey from 1946 to 1961. Over this past winter, we discovered a bunch of the stuff that uh, John Barsoli uh, drew. John was a uh, artist. He would hang out with uh, Bull, and as people would come in, he would give them nice names and nice pictures and put them on wanted posters and stuff like that. I would love to know who these people really were because I'm sure there's somebody uh, that he drew that, that, that inspired him to, to draw these pictures. Over in the, the corner we have uh, crickets. Cricket was a, a famous tommyhawk maker and he always wore that hat to your right and, and that was his outfit that he wore during the shoots. Uh, from what I understand, you weren't anybody unless you had a cricket tommyhawk. So he, he was very proud of uh, of uh, Tommy Hawk throwing, and that was donated to the association when he passed.
I mentioned the stairway downstairs in the, in the front foyer when we first started. That would have come up right about here. This is where the, the hired the hired hands, the, the guys that worked in the field and took care of the stock and so forth. This is where they would have, this would have been their bedroom. Uh, at that time, that time this doorway was not there. This was a solid room. So the only way in and out of this room was up and down that stairway. Uh, you can imagine two guys sleeping in here, not to mention trying to get up the stairway. It would have been quite, quite uh, an adventure. 1966, uh, when National Muzzleloaders took it over, they converted this into a kitchen for Maxine Moss, closed off the stairway, like I said, to make a pipe chase, and opened that hole to the rest of the house. The hired girls would have stayed in this room back in the day. This would have been uh, their bedroom. And again, the hired guys had no access to the rest of the house, so the girls were over here. And again, when Maxine Moss and her husband took over the, the building, they made this into a formal bathroom. This was the two bedrooms. If you notice down the center, you'll see where the flooring has been replaced. This was two bedrooms at, at the time, then in 1996, uh, the association made this one big room. They also cut a door into the, into the, uh, into the, the, the ladies' room. And one of the interesting things about this that I didn't realize, even though I worked in this room for quite a, a number of days, is that when the Rands had this house built, the, they must have had carpenters, that each carpenter took a room and did the woodworking. And like I said, I never realized it. But one day when I was given a tour, I happened to look around and look at the woodwork on this door and window are different than the woodwork on this door or this window and this, this door and this window. Of course, the, the closet was added later, and of course, the, the door to the bathroom was also later. So it was used, used that cheap modern, modern woodwork. But when you come into here, you'll notice both doorways are the same. I'm not entirely sure why they did that, other than each carpenter had his own, own idea of how to do things. Uh, since everything was hand, hand done, uh, you know, I guess they did their own thing. I don't know. Uh, but it was interesting. On one side of the wall, you have two different moldings, and on the this side of the wall, you have the same moldings, because this was one room. This is where the Rams would have done all their, this would have been like our, our family room of today. This is where they would have hung out. Uh, Mrs. Ram was quite the seamstress, so she, she made all of her own cloth and sewed in the sewing machine. And uh, in, this, in the wintertime, like I said, I would imagine this was a warmer room in the house. We have a Red Russell's been a very understanding wife because he used to bring this ironing board down to the chutes back in the early days. And you can imagine when he brought it home with as muddy as it sometimes gets down here, what it would look like. But apparently she was very understanding. Over on this wall is a, a print of Daniel Boone. And about, we found it downstairs and about a month or two after we hung it, it showed up on Facebook on the Fest Parker website, him standing next to it. And recently, 
the National Mausoleum and Rifle Association magazine, we had the same picture, which I thought was pretty cool. Even though it was for an advertisement, it's still, it's still cool that you see the same picture on there. Here we have a, what's called a pump gun. It was used, it was used to mount on the front of a boat. And the guy would lay in the bottom of the boat and drift out to where the ducks were. And when he would get close enough, he let them have it. It'd be loaded with nail screws, stones, bolts, whatever they had available. they load down that thing and when they let her rip, it would take uh, about 800 reps at a time. That was back during the market days. Like I said, every room in the house has different molding. This is a particular molding that I like. Here is the porch. This is the best view of the association property. Um, you can see everything from here. During the shoots, when all the flags are up, it's just beautiful. All the different uh, country flags and, and uh, state flags and so forth are all flying across the front here. And with the, with the creek in the background and, and the rest of the association uh, numbers shooting and so forth, it's just a sight to behold. In 2003, Buddy Ramsey, and Buddy Townsend, and his group of volunteers uh, started to rehab the, the the first floor and so forth. And they needed money, so they came up with the commemorative brick walkway. And then, in, also in 2003, Rick Blizzard and his family installed them and put the uh, put the ramp in. So if you need a, if you want a memorial cell forever or, or some, some loved one or something, that would be a nice way to do it. Just threw a brick on the, on the sidewalk. And all the money that's collected from the bricks goes to help keep this ranch house running. How long have you been working on the ranch house, you know, and volunteering your time? In 2013, well, actually, I retired in 2011, and uh, T and I were taking care of her dad, who had dementia at the time. And uh, when he passed away, Tina had some surgery done, and then I was looking for something to do once in a while. So I came down here and talked to Terry, and, and she didn't have anything going on. She said, well, check with Dan, so, or that time, that time was Bob Westler. I believe. And him and Dan were over in the maintenance building. And I went over there, this was like in March, and I said, you know, I'm looking for something to do once in a while. You got, you got something I can do? She said, no, but there's this little girl that's coming in in a little bit. She's going to bring us some cookies, and uh, she might have something for you. Well, at that time in January, Annie had started working on, Annie Dean had started working on cleaning up the ranch house because it was in such bad shape. The, uh, the mold problem was 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 terrible and so forth. So uh, she came in and I said, "One well, more for too. She said, "Well, come on." So she gave me a paint scraper, put me on the floor of the bathroom upstairs, and I scraped paint all day. My legs killed me by the time the day was over, but I knew at that time that this was a place to be saved for the association members, both past and present, to show that we really appreciate what they have done to, 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 to keep our sport alive and, and they need it to be, uh, be recognized. And that's what we're trying to do right now. Make it a historic building, it's on the, on the, 
on the list of historic places and uh, with the state of Indiana or national I guess it's a national historic foundation and uh, we're just trying to save it trying to get it back to where it was back in 1878 and uh, and try to show some of what the numbers do how long have you been a member of the NMLRA and, and been coming down and well, I became a member back in the early 90s, I believe. I don't have an exact exact date, but I got my first muzzle loader in I think 1989 from uh, Dave Perozzoli. Took me about a year and a half to get it. Came came from Texas, and uh, they uh, they only allowed so many at that time with with tariffs and so forth they were only allowed so many guns to come through a year so I waited about a year and a half till I got my rifle and in that case was a pamphlet of the NMLRA well I lived in Cincinnati Ohio at the time so uh, I looked at it, it looked kind of neat I came down to a couple shoots just to like most people just to walk around and uh, and look to see what was going on. Then I became a member, like I said, in probably the early 90s, uh, somewhere around in the early 2000s, and I never really shot because I never really knew anybody. Uh, shortly thereafter, in, about in the early 2000s, uh, I'm a member of Southern Ohio Dog and Game in Cincinnati, and we had moved to Indiana, to Lawrenceburg, and uh, one of the guys at Southern Ohio Dog and Game, Mike Wiseman, said I was talking to him about the NMLRA. I just come back from a a work weekend here, and he said, you know, I've, I've always wanted to, to become a member here. So I gave him a gift membership. Well, now I knew somebody. So that's when I actually started shooting down here. And then, like I said, in 2013, I. I came down for the occasional work day, which ended up being like a weekly thing. <laughs> and I've even drafted my wife, so uh, that's that's worth about where it is. So, do you shoot much anymore, or are you just kind of hanging out more now? Now that uh, Annie's moved on and nobody else has is, is, uh, found an interest in, in taking care of the. Uh, the building or helping me out or any whatever during the shoots I try to to be a monitor here and then uh, and then be a another monitor over at the gunmakers hall because I'm usually here from 11 to 2 and then I can take from 3 to 5 at gunmakers hall and help them out and since I don't usually get out here till like 2:30 it's not hardly youth worth it to clean a gun at just one or two shoots I tried that the first couple years really didn't work out so to answer your question, I'm not a, a shooter at the Nationals, but if we have a small shoot like the one we had this weekend, then I'll probably shoot that. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Bob. I really appreciate your time and, and all the effort you're putting in here. Well, just doing my part. <laughs>